Thank you for the privilege of sharing God's word with you today. Some of you know Matthew and Ruth, and uh, it's really under God's hand that uh, Matthew and Ruth and their boys have us here. For those of you that call them, particularly my son, Matt, we just want to set it straight. Okay. His, his mother calls him Matthew, his father calls him Matthew, and God calls him Matthew. <laughs> it is a privilege to share with you. Uh, this is one of the unusual times in preaching. People have normally expected like the heat to come from the front from the preacher and uh, not from the back, so it's a little bit different in every way today but of all the things I want you to remember if once we get into the book of Joshua if you forget everything else would you remember this today that Jesus has never loved you more than Jesus loves you right now you know that there's nothing you can do to make him love you more there's nothing you can do to have him love you less. And the greatest thrill of sharing the love of the Lord Jesus is sharing with people the depth of his love. So when we sing a song, and I enjoyed the lament at Jesus, when are you gonna wake up? Have you noticed this? that he rarely shows up early, but he's never late. In the midst of the crisis of life, Jesus shows up. Let me ask you, how's your memory? Look sideways at somebody that knows you, if you need to, how's your memory? Many years ago, Annette and I were at a concert in Stratford, Ontario, at the Festival Theatre. And once we were seated, I looked at her and said, these are almost the identical seats that we had at the last concert we were here. And Annette said, Steve, we, we've never been here for a concert. He said, most certainly we have been here for a concert. Here's who it was. We were sit seated here. You were wearing a red dress. And at that moment, like this stab of pain went through my brain. And I remembered that I was there before I'd ever met the net. <laughs> This is not good, people. <laughs> but at the end of this month, we've been married 45 years. So she's put up with it. An old song went like this, memories are so beautiful and yet what's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. So it's the laughter we will remember whenever we remember the way we were. That's wrong. We do remember the painful things, don't we? There's some hurts that we don't think we'll ever forget. So what do we do in the midst of that? I want to invite you to take your Bibles if you have a copy of God's Word with you, either uh, a hard copy or maybe on your phone, I suspect it'll be a little difficult to read it on the phone today, to Joshua and the fourth chapter. We'll be in Joshua 3 and 4 today because one of the things that happens throughout the scripture is that God calls on his people to remember, to have stakes in the ground, as it were. At different points, when God does something in our lives, 
to do something so that we will remember. You know, I know that the ultimate remembrance is when we meet at the table of the Lord Jesus as he instituted the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever you may call it, and said, do this in remembrance of me. Because it's really desperately important that we remember. As Joshua is about to lead the people across the Jordan into the land that was promised to them, remember that the oldest people other than Joshua and Caleb could only be 60 years old when they had turned back 40 years earlier from Kadesh Barnea, God's judgment for their unbelief was this, that all of them over 20 years old would die in the wilderness. The majority of the people who had seen the wonders of Egypt, who had seen the miracle of the Red Sea work there to speak again. You say, why is that important? Because some of you are first generation believers. I was privileged to grow up in a home where my mom and dad loved Jesus, my four grandparents loved Jesus, but they were first generation. My grandfather had a farm out in the boonies outside of Bancroft, Ontario. And a man stopped by one day when my grandfather was out working his farm and talked to him about Jesus. And talked to him about Jesus and his love. And ultimately, my grandfather's life was transformed. And that's where it started in my family. And so through the years, I've heard the stories of my grandparents' faith and what God had done for them and my parents' faith and what God had done for them. But if you're here today in your first generation, you say, well, what about me? Well, that's what's happening in Joshua 3 and 4. And the key to it, if you look in chapter 4 with me, Joshua says this in verse 6. This will be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Now, how important was it for Joshua? So he says it there, then go later in the same chapter, verse 21, after they were over. When your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? So there are specific points in our spiritual walk where God has shown up in a really strong way. When we left seminary, our first church was in Blind River. So if you know Blind River, I mean, we were coming out of Dallas, Texas. And we arrived in Blind River. We knew it wasn't quite the end of the earth, but we were sure we could see it from there. And it's this little town. Some of my friends in southern Ontario, I'd grown up in Oshawa, said, Steve, don't, don't go there. Like, no one will ever find you. And Annette was expecting. We were going to take two weeks 
have a little break and then start ministry. I mean, Lord, here we are. Prepared, we're sacrificing for you. Our mailbox number in Blind River was uh, post office box three. <laughs> and in that two weeks, we suffered a miscarriage. And we needed God to show up. Because for us, it was, Lord, how, how could that happen? Frankly, for me, like, what more do you want from me? And that's when I was told a story. I have two older sisters. One's seven years older than I am. The other one's eight years older than I am. And uh, I had had people tell me when I was growing up, oh, Steve, don't you know that you were an oops? That's really unkind to say to a kid, eh? Don't you know you were an oops? Well, after suffering the miscarriage, is back in those days, uh, parents didn't talk about things the way they do today. My mom told me that after my second sister was born in a period of a couple of years, my parents had suffered a couple of miscarriages. And the doctor had told them they needed to wait at least five years and so that's what took place. And my mom had built some places of memory of where God showed up and showed himself strong on her behalf. And she was able to share that here has how the Lord sustained us through that. And our testimony became, here's how the Lord sustained us in the midst of our pain. But if you're first generation, you may only know the stories. And in the readings in this past week, you've been reading about the crossing of the Red Sea. You've been reading about the people at Mara, and the water was bitter, and the Lord tells Moses, uh, throw a log in the water and it'll become sweet. And then they go to Rephidim and there's no water and the Lord says to Moses, strike the rock and water will come forth. He strikes the rock with the rod that he had used before Pharaoh and the water comes forth. They go to Mirabah and God says, speak to the rock and the water will come forth. And Moses struck the rock. And because of that disobedience, Moses didn't get to go into the land. And if you have ever wondered, after all the nonsense that he put up with from those people, and he strikes the rock the second time instead of speaking to it, and God, what? What's with that? And Paul helps us because in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, and that rock was Christ. And God had set up an object lesson for time and for eternity that the rock Christ was struck once for our redemption. And bless God since then, for all of us, we simply come to the rock and speak to him and the water gushes forth. We come into his presence and speak to him, and he exudes grace to us. <laughs>
But you can imagine as Joshua is the lieutenant to Moses, that as Moses grew older and all these miracles had been taking place, and now it's going to be the next generation that people are going to be saying this, not as good as Moses, not as good as Moses. I've had the opportunity a couple of times to follow pastors that had been in a church a long time and were much beloved. And you know, you just know what's going to happen. At first, it's sort of exciting because it's a new voice and different personality types. And eventually you hear in the background something like, not as good as the last guy. The only, the only uh, comfort I take in that is uh, we've stayed a couple of places a long time and I'm just hoping they did that to the guy after me. But for those of you who are first generation believers, would you put yourself in the place of Joshua where God is saying, look, I am going to do for you what I did for Joshua so that in time to come, when the stories are told, you'll be able to look back. And it's not just Moses' story. It's not just people who are older story. This is your story of faith. This is what God did for you, that your testimony is just as valid and more so than what's gone on in the past. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear uh, somebody give a personal testimony. And I heard a preacher say one time that, you know, at, at his church, he just got tired of the people that would stand up and uh, say, I want to thank God that 40 years ago in a cornfield in Oklahoma, he saved me. And this pastor said, and I want to say, but has he done anything for you lately? And the great news for us is simply sharing, here's what God is doing in my life right now, even if it's a time for you of silence. Even if it's a time for you when your heart is crying. Jesus, when are you going to wake up? Here's my difficulty. And as God is taking you through the seasons of your life, he wanted to do this for Israel. You take the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant for them was the presence of God. That's how he presenced himself with them. He presences himself with us by his spirit. If you're in Jesus today, God's spirit indwells you right now where you're seated. He presenced himself with Israel and showed them outwardly it's in the Ark of the Covenant. And bless God, the picture that he forms is not this. Um, you, you go across the Jordan and I'll watch. Never. God isn't a distant God. He's a present God. And so the rule was this. Take the Ark of the Covenant Take it in to the midst of the Jordan. And if you check, if you check, you'll see that the Jordan was in flood stage. Why is that important? Friday, and that night went out to Cascades. And we didn't really like look at the map. We just decided we would walk. 
Now, I don't know if you know the colors of the trails at Cascade, but we ended up doing the red and the orange. And as we're getting back towards the vehicle, I'm really hoping we have cell service at least like 911. And Matthew and Ruth had taken us out there the first week of April, just after we arrived. What a difference. This raging torrent back in April, and now, oh, look at, look at all those rocks, etc. So when God wants to show Joshua his power and the might, he doesn't want this to happen. Look, the River Jordan's at its lowest point. You'd barely get your ankles wet. That can hardly compare to the Red Sea. God takes them across. When the text says, the Jordan is overflowing its banks so that there's going to be no doubt whatsoever that God is with them. They go into the middle. The waters stop. The rest of the waters go down to the Dead Sea. And upstream somewhere, God walls up the waters. And the text says the people go across on dry ground. And Joshua says, I don't want you to forget. And it's important not just for some of the people, but all of the people to remember. So for each of the 12 tribes, choose one guy. You're going to get a rock out of the middle of the Jordan, and you're going to take the rock, and you're going to put this heap of stones. Because in time to come, your children are going to say, what do these stones mean to you? And they're going to talk about, here's when God showed himself strong on our behalf. Here's when God showed up. Here's what Jesus has done for us. So what are you going to remember? Would you put a stone up where God has revealed his presence to you in a very powerful way when it was unmistakable, when all you could say was, I cried out and the Lord heard me. And I want to mark that. And I'll tell my spouse, I'll tell my partner, I'll tell my best friend, I'll tell my children. For some of us, I'll tell my grandchildren, here's where the presence of God was so clear to me. God said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So we look for the times when it's evident that God's presence is with us. But remember his promises to us, because as sure as they were to Moses and as sure as they were to Joshua, they are to me. Jesus has promised me this, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. There may be times when you don't sense my presence. It doesn't change the fact that I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. In difficult times, the promise is this. You'll never face a temptation that is brand new to you. We face temptations that are common. And God's promise to us is that with every temptation, he'll make a way for us to escape so that we can bear it.
So in the midst of temptation, the promise that I cling to is, Lord, please show me in this situation because I don't want to fall into sin. Show me a way of escape so that I can please you. What about the really difficult times? Here it was flood stage. But in the calendar year, there are times when the Jordan goes down, down, down. And the people are once again desperate for water. There's a little verse, don't, don't go by it too quickly. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 9, And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. The 12 stones that he set up at Gilgal. Anytime people are going through Gilgal and they say, what these 12 stones, what are they about? I tell you, that's when God showed himself strong, when Jesus showed up and we were able to go on dry ground across the Jordan. But 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan I learned about that at Cascades this week. Because as the dryness and heat would descend upon the nation, and the river went down, and the river went down, ultimately 12 rocks would begin to appear. And just when you might have thought, they might have thought, has God forsaken us? Has God given up on us? Has he brought us into this land and now here we're going to die of thirst? There start appearing 12 rocks that, that you wouldn't see when there was lots of water wouldn't see when you're dying of thirst but now in the midst of the current crisis their stones reminding you of god's faithfulness there in the middle so i ask you today what stones are you looking for what stones are you building that you can remember the presence of God that remind you of the promises and the power of God remind you of his care remind you of his love because in the dry times of life Jesus just as surely shows up to remind us this. He says to your heart and to mine, I have never loved you more than I love you right now. My child, there is nothing you can do to cause me to love you more there is nothing you can do to cause me to love you less. That's the Jesus who's present here right now. Whether it's flood stage for you, whether everything's calm for you, or whether this is a dry time. 
Would you look at the memories that God has placed in your life and say, even when I can't see or feel you now, I choose to trust that what you have begun to do in my life, you'll keep your promise and you'll do it throughout the rest of my life. Did you do that today? Thanks for the privilege of sharing with you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the remembrances from your word that you're faithful you keep your promises and as surely as you did to ancient Israel you do for your people today thank you Jesus that you are present with us Holy Spirit thank you for teaching us and encouraging us and assuring our hearts Thank you for grassroots and the good ministry that takes place here. And ask for your continued blessing in these days of transition. That as a church, the people of God here would hear the still small voice of the Spirit saying, this is the way, walk in it. We pray all this in the strong name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.